Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. Father, we are so grateful that you have allowed us to study your Word in an open, free society where we can speak the name of Jesus, we can open the Word of God, We can stand on the word of God, even though the world doesn't. I pray that you'll allow that to continue in our churches and in our homes and with each one of us. For this study, God, thank you for bringing each of the women that you have brought here. As Sandy said, this isn't an accident that they're here. I pray that you will touch each woman's heart. I pray, Father, that you will stir up in the hearts of each person here who you are, and the power of your word, and what you want them to learn, and how you want them to walk with you. Because God, if we come here for knowledge, we're going to be sorely disappointed. We may gain the knowledge, but it's not the knowledge that causes us, shows us how we should live in this life. So help us to grow and learn, and use this time wisely, getting to know you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, most people don't study the post-exilic prophets or even the Old Testament prophets. So it's great to see that several of you have. I hope that you'll be sharing your insights as we go along in class. But you need to understand where the post-exilic prophets fall into the scheme of the history of Israel. By the way, last year I developed a um, uh, herniated disc, and so I had to sit down to teach because I couldn't stand. Now I can stand, but I like the sitting down to teach. (laughs) I hope you don't mind, so I'll be sitting down most of the time. But I can stand now, so that's good. Now, as we talk about the history of Israel, let's walk through that. Who did God call to be the patriarch or the first person to develop the nation of Israel? Abraham. So it all starts with Abraham. And then after Abraham, Abraham had many children. But which child did the promise, the covenant that God made with Abraham, which child did that go through? Isaac, which, and then what child after that? Jacob. Jacob. So we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is so important because this is the lineage. This is the promise of the Abrahamic covenant that God made to Abraham, the promise that Abraham will be blessed, the promise of the land, the promise of descendants, and the most important, the what? The Messiah. The promise of the Messiah would come through the loins of Abraham, but not through Ishmael, not through any of the other children that he had, but only through Isaac and then Jacob. So we have historically, and we have biblically, the genealogy of the Messiah all the way back to Abraham. So we have the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, under Jacob's son Joseph, the Israelites ended up going where? Egypt. So they sojourned to Egypt, or they were slaves in Egypt, even though they weren't slaves the entire time. But they, uh, they went down there not as slaves, but over the course of 400 years, they became slaves until God called them out. Who did he use to call them out? Moses. So they exited East Egypt, Exodus, Exodus, from Egypt. And... Uh, I don't have the dates here, but at some point I'll probably hand you out a a timeline chart so you can see all that. They exited Egypt. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until they came into what? The promised land or the land that we now know as Israel. Promise. I. Okay. Learn how to spell here. The promised land. When they came into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, Then over time, they needed some leaders. So God raised up for them some men. Who were they called? Well, actually one woman too. Who were they called? The judges. There were 13 judges. One of them was a woman, surprisingly enough. By the way, not, not all 13 judges are listed in the book of Judges. So if you go to count them, you won't find 13. But there are 13 judges. But that wasn't good enough. The judges were only for different parts of the country, not for the whole country necessarily, though Samuel was pretty much the whole country. He was the last judge. So the people said, we want to be like all the other nations. Therefore, raise up for us a king. 
king. So we had the time period of the kings. Who was the first king? Saul. Did, was he a good king? No, nope, he disobeyed God, so God took the kingdom from him, the promise that could have been the promised kingdom, and gave it to David. And it is the lineage of David where the Messiah was promised to come through him. Uh, and again, we can see that in Matthew chapter 1 as we look at Christ's genealogy. So David was the second king. The third king was Solomon. Solomon. Was Solomon a good king? <laughs> yeah. He was a good king as long as he followed his father's steps, as long as he followed God. But then he had a problem. What was his problem? Women. Women. <laughs> they led his heart astray from God. And so because of that, let me read you the passage over here in uh, 1 Kings chapter 11. Because no matter if we follow God 99% of the time and we don't follow him 100%, there are consequences. We saw that with Moses, great man of God who disobeyed God once and he wasn't able to go into the promised land. In uh, 1 Kings chapter 11, it says in verse 6, Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as his father David did. And what he did was he built an altar for the god Shemesh, the detestable idol of Moab on the mountain, which is east of Jerusalem. Those of you who've been there, that's Mount of Olives. He built an altar to Shemesh. And as well as Molech, the detestable idol of the son of Ammon. So it tells us in verse 11, God said to him, because you have done this and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days. So after King Solomon, the nation of Israel was divided. We have a period called the divided kings. Actually, from then on out, it was a divided kingdom. What was it divided into? Okay, the north and the south. The north was known as what? Israel. And the south was called? Judah. By the way, where do we get the name Jews? What? From Judah. Because when the, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. When they were taken into exile, it was easier to call them Jews from Judah than anything else. So that's where they got the name. So the kingdom was divided under Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son. And uh, it remained divided until all of a sudden they were conquered. In 722 BC, the north was conquered by whom? By the Assyrians. North was conquered by the Assyrians. And then, but the south was saved. Judah was saved at that point because of some good kings. By the way, under the period of kings, there were 20 kings on both the north and the south. And on the s northern side, I can't remember. It was either six or eight that were good kings. And on the southern side, none. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. The northern side had no good kings, and the southern side had six or eight good kings. Now I say no good kings. Jehu on the northern side was good for a while, but then he turned away from God. So you can understand why the northern kingdom was taken into captivity because God will judge us when we turn away from him. And he told them in Deuteronomy 28 and the blessings and the cursings passage that if you do these things and you follow me and you obey my word, then you will be blessed. And these are all the blessings I'm going to give you. But if you don't obey my word and follow the law, these are all the curses that you're going to experience. And one of them is being taken over by other nations. As a matter of fact, the very last curse is that you will be a byword in all the nations. Are we seeing that today in anti-Semitism? That's right. She said this is in why it's so important for us to be pay praying for our country, for the nations, because if we go in the wrong direction, we will be judged. Yes, we live under grace. We don't live under the law. But there's consequences to sin, always, no matter what time period you live in. So if we don't pray for our country and our country continues to move away from God, 
we can expect disaster to come. As a matter of fact, as we're talking about Joel on Tuesday nights, I made the similarity that the disaster that they're going through at the time of Joel is like us in 9-11 because we went through the worst experience we've ever had on this soil by an outside group ever. And what did we do? We went to church. We were sad. We prayed for a week, maybe. And then we turned to the government and kind of forgot about it. We, we celebrate it. That we celebrate, commemorate it every year. But we have forgotten that I don't know if that was judgment from God. Only he knows that. But it could have been. And we didn't repent. We need to do that. So the northern kingdom, because they didn't obey God much more than the southern kingdom, they were taken in captive, captivity to Assyria. By the way, when they were taken captive, they went into, uh, many of the people in Israel were killed. Many of them were taken captive into Assyria. And some of them were left in the northern kingdom because the purpose of the Assyrians was not to destroy everyone, but instead to bring people from Assyria and assimilate them into the culture of the lands that they were conquering. So the northern kingdom ended up having Jews intermarrying with people from Assyria, who may have been from all parts of the world who had been conquered. And we came to call them the who? Samaritans. So to me, Samaritans are what some people might say are half-breeds because they're half-Jewish and they're half-something else, half-Gentile. And so those are the people that Israel, uh, they, w they were not favored in Israel because they were not true Jews. Okay, that's the northern kingdom. When was the southern kingdom conquered? All right, 586 B.C. is when the southern kingdom was conquered by who? Babylon. And that's because Babylon had conquered Assyria. So they took over their area. So at this point, again, people are taken to Babylon. There were actually three sieges in this war. The first one was 605. The second siege was 597. But the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple happened in 586 BC. These people were taken to Babylon, do you know of anyone in the Bible who was taken to at Babylon? Daniel. Daniel. And his friend, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. At the same time, Ezekiel and Jeremiah were prophesying in Jerusalem. So they were contemporaries, but not in Babylon. So the southern kingdom was conquered by Babylon. So that means that all of these people went into what? Exile. So when the people come back from exile, it's called post-exilic. So you have this post-exilic time that's going to start with Ezra. And that happens in 536 B.C. when God allows them to come back from exile, from this exile that they went into, allowed the people to come back to their land. So after all of this history and after all the, the prophets and the poetry that we see in the Bible, then you have six books that were written that are called the post-exilic books. Those are the ones that we're studying this year. So understand the mentality. When they come back, they technically have no king. They are a bunch of wandering people who have priests, as we will see. They have some government officials, but they really don't have legitimate kings that follow the lineage of David. Okay, what about the lost tribes of Israel, you're saying? Now, these, the northern kings, kingdom are 10 tribes of Israel. Remember, there's 12 tribes in Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob. And the southern kingdom are two tribes. Little trivia, who are those two tribes? Okay, Benjamin and Judah. Very good. Those are the two tribes in the southern kingdom. So the question is, what happened to the lost tribes of Israel, the northern kingdom, the tribes that were taken by Assyria before Babylon came in? People call them the lost tribes, but they're not lost. First of all, they're not lost in God's eyes. Secondly, we know they're not lost because in Revelation, we see in chapter 7 the, that God 
seals 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, he couldn't do that if they were lost, could he? Now, did they go into exile? Yes, but they came back too. If you look at uh, Luke chapter 2, when Jesus went into the temple, when Jesus was taken into the temple to be circumcised, there were two people in the temple waiting for him because God had said they would see them. Who were they? Simeon and Anna. Anna. And do you know who Anna was? She was from the tribe of Asher. Asher is one of the ten tribes. So we see places after the post-exilic time where people from the northern kingdom were back in Israel. So these pe the tribes were not lost. Yes, people may have stayed in exile, but many people from the tribes came back. So this is the period we're in now, the post-exilic period that starts in five, well, it starts with the decree in 538, but it starts when Ezra goes, when the people go back in 536. Does that make sense? Okay, we're all on the same page as we move forward. Now you know what post-exilic means. Well, I have a tendency to put stuff in writing sometimes that I think is too difficult to get on the board. So I hope you all got this handout because we're going to walk through it a little bit now. If you didn't, raise your hand and Sandy will pass out. Oh, a lot of you didn't get it. Okay. She will pass it out. The, um, I'm a little anal when it comes to things. One of the things is I was seeing all of these kings that were, are listed in the book of Ezra. And then I was thinking of all six of these books that we're going to be studying. I was wondering of the timeline and everything. So I put together a timeline. So as we go along, we know what's happening and when. I remember the first time I studied Ezra, I was reading along and it was all making sense. And then all of a sudden, it didn't. Different kings. And I realized we have a time gap in the book of Ezra where it stops and it's, we don't hear anything for several decades and then Ezra resumes. So we need to know those things. That's the purpose of this time chart. Plus, my dear friend Phyllis, years ago, <laughs> said, when I was teaching something, she said, well, do you have that in a handout? <laughs> so I found that it's easier for me and for you if we have it in a handout. So let's, while she's passing that out, so let's talk about the book of Ezra. Let's talk about Ezra, first of all. It says in Ezra chapter 1, well, actually, <laughs> it doesn't even mention Ezra in Ezra chapter 1. So who wrote the book? Ezra. I gave the answer. doesn't tell you that here. It actually never tells you that in the book. But the, the Jewish Bible has the books of Ezra and Nehemiah together as one book. And they will tell you historically that they believe Ezra wrote the book because she was, he was actively involved in all that was going on at that time. So he wrote it. Now, we know later you haven't studied it yet, because one thing you didn't have to do this year was do a book, book chart and a book study. A lot of times in precept classes, before you get into a book, you have to study, the, you have to read the whole book and then write out chapter titles or at least um, information about the book. But you didn't have to do that this time, so I'm giving you the answers. Ezra means helper, which he clearly is. He's a scribe. What's a scribe? Okay, a person who writes things. A scribe is generally a, <coughs> a Bible teacher, for lack of a better way of saying it. This man loved the law of the Lord. He loved it. He wanted people to know it. He wanted people to practice it. And we're going to see that. He was also a priest, according to chapter 7, verse 11. So that means that he obviously would have some priestly opportunities. He wasn't a political leader. He was a religious leader. And the title, at least according to um, Irving Jensen, the title to this book is Restoration and Reformation. And that's really, I think, a great title because the book is broken into, if you skip down to book divisions, it's broken into two sections. Chapters 1 through 6 and then chapters 7 through 10. Chapters 1 through 6 talk about the restoration under Zerubbabel. He's the government leader. And that's the, also the rebuilding of the temple. So they are restoring the nation again, coming back to it and restoring it. In chapters 7 to 10, 
that's going to be difficult for a lot of us to read because they're talking, there's spiritual reformation. Ezra comes in and he is requiring people to do things that in our culture we would not like. But he's requiring them to do that by the law. He wants the people to learn from their exile. They were exiled because they didn't obey God, and he wants them to learn how to obey God. So two different sections in the book. One is Reformation, um, Restoration, and the other is Reformation. Now the key words. Again, I've given you key words. Unless you've read the book, you'll see that there are some decrees in here several decrees throughout the book, and you might want to mark them just so you know them. By the way, that also tells you that the decrees were written in Arabic. So part of this book is written in Arabic, and part of it's written in Hebrew. You see that in one other book in Scripture. Do you know what that book is? Daniel. Exactly right. Because Daniel was living in a time when they spoke Arabic, and so he wrote some of the things there in Arabic and then some in Hebrew. But the key words tell you what the book's about. There's decrees, Jerusalem, house of the Lord, and law. So what's the focus of the book about? Hmm, a decree to go back to Jerusalem. Hmm, once they get there, what are they supposed to do? Build the temple, revive the law. Whenever you have key words, which are repeated words in a book, that will really give you the overview of what the book's about because they're talked about so often. We think it was written around 450 BC, which is after a lot of this happened, but nobody knows for sure the exact date, but they, they say it's about 450 BC. And again, the theme is regathering, the, the regathering, and then God fulfilling his promises. That's key, we'll see that when we get into chapter one. God fulfilling his promises. How do you think the Jews felt during those hundreds of years of exile as to was God with them? Did God left them? Would they ever go back to their land? Would they ever see God again? Would they ever know what he wanted them to do? So it's important to have a book like this that gives them hope. Isn't that something we need is hope? Yeah. And then uh, key verses. So first key verse that's mentioned is chapter 2, verse 1, and really that just says that the exiles are going back. It says specifically, now these are the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of the exiles from Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He had carried away in Babylon and returned to Jerusalem and Judea, each to his own city. So basically it's a key verse because it says this is the return from exile. And then another key verse which is a very important verse to me, is Ezra 7.10. That's a verse God gave me in 1996 when he called me to take God's word teaching into Israel. Ezra 7.10 says, Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord and practice it. Now that right there gives you a definition of a scribe, of someone who knows the law. He dedicated himself to study the law of the Lord and practice it. That's been my goal ever since I found that verse. And I hope it's your goal too. Because just learning the knowledge isn't enough. We need to know how to live out God's word. So Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and his ordinances in Israel. That's what we're going to see here. He's going to be teaching them in Israel. Absolutely. That is such a good observation in that while they were in exile, they had, to, they had a choice. They could be miserable and mourn and weep and, oh, poor me, because we're here as slaves, kind of, even though they weren't all slaves. They were assimilated into the culture. But they could be miserable, or they could do what God wanted them to do, which many of them did, which is they bloomed where they were planted. They grew. You look at Daniel, Meshach and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Uh, you look at what many believe was to be such a strong influence from God's word in Babylon and Assyria in that area that the Magi came looking for the Messiah because they knew what the, what the Bible said and they knew what to look for. And perhaps it's that strong biblical influence that these people had that influenced Cyrus to say what he says when we get into this book. 
But the key here that Linda was making too is that they needed to train up their children because it's their children who would be going back. They knew, and we'll get into it in a minute, they knew they'd be going back in 70 years. That's their children and their grandchildren. It's not them. So they want their children and their grandchildren to learn so they don't make the same mistakes they did. And therefore, they also need to learn the word. Yeah, good point. She said, it'd be interesting when we get to heaven to talk to people from the Inner Testament period between Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, and Matthew, the first book of the New. Those are quiet years. Israel didn't hear anything from God that's recorded that we have in writing. Uh, what did they do? What did they say? What happened? Well, we know historically what happened. You can read the book of Maccabees, among other books of the uh, Apocrypha, which are non-biblical, but they're historic. And they can give you a really good example of how Israel fell. In those 400 silent years, they walked away from God again. Sad. Mm. Culture and sin start to infiltrate no matter what they do. You know, we can... Um, we can do the best job we can with our children, but we can't control them. We can't determine where they go. Look at David. You know, whether he did a good job with his children, I don't know, but he sure had a lot of rebellious children. Uh, you know, we look at some of our pastors. They do as good a job as they can do, and their children turn rebellious. The key is we are obedient to God in how we live our lives and what we do. And the other key is that we train up our children in the way they should go so that when they're old, they will not depart from it. That's our job. It's not the church's job. It's not the school's job. Not the neighbor's job. It's our job. And since most of us in this room are grandparents, it's our job as grandparents, too, to have that impact on your grandchildren because the world is not going to. Oh, uh, the Apocrypha books? Um, the the uh, Council of... Jamnia? I think it was the Council of Jamnia. No, the Council of Jamnia authenticated the Old Testament books. And then the Council of... I uh, can't think of what it was. But it w what was it? Nicaea? It might have been. It might have been the Council of Nicaea. Council of Jamnia in 90 AD affirmed all of the Old Testament books as, as being biblical from God's spoken word to mankind. And they had several criteria that they used to determine that they were actually God-spoken, God-breathed, because we know from 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God. So it had to be inspired by God. Then when you get to the New Testament, you have the Council of Nicaea, which were godly leaders, biblical scholars, who used the same, I mean, similar criteria. Had to be, whoever wrote it had to be um, a disciple of Christ. Paul wasn't a direct disciple, but he was called by God and, and made a disciple. Um, they had several criteria that they had to be, a, and the gospel had to be shared. That's why the book of James was the last book to enter the New Testament because it doesn't share the gospel. Very interesting. Uh, it, a lot of practical application, but it didn't share the gospel. But James was Jesus' brother, and, and they felt there was enough application in there that it would, be, it would fit into the New Testament. So those are how the Old and New Testament were codified into what we have. Then you have these extra biblical writings, and you have the Gospel of Thomas, which I don't think that's in the Apocrypha, but you have additions to Daniel and Ezra, and you have the Book of Maccabees and historical things. But there was no proof that they were written by anyone who had direct revelation from God. So the Catholic Church believes that those are part of the Bible. The Protestant Church doesn't. And I use it, I've got one, and I read especially uh, Maccabees because it's so good on the history, the intertestament period uh, between Mac uh, Malachi and, um, and Matthew. You can learn a lot of the history of what went on there, but I don't take it as gospel. Okay, I'm glad you said that. One of the things that Ezra was believed to have been was the one who codified a lot of the, who brought together a lot of the Old Testament scriptures. It was Ezra, and it was Ezra also, while they were in exile, who is the one who developed the synagogue structure. They didn't have synagogues before, but they developed them while they were in exile so they could have a place of community and a place of worship, a place to study the word of God. And all of that, it's believed, came under Ezra. Again, that's not biblical, it's historical. Yeah. When, uh, going back to 1 Kings chapter 11 and 12, 
when the kingdom divided, the uh, Jeroboam, who was the head of the king of the northern kingdom, he didn't want anybody going back down to Jerusalem to worship God, so he developed his own priests. They weren't Levites. He just developed them so that they could do what he wanted them to do, and he started two different holid uh, two different cities, one in Dan and one in Bethel, which were the northern and southern part of his northern kingdom, where he had people go worship. So there's been a lot of false information that has fallen through the years and a lot of false priests going down through the years and false kings. Did you know that we even had a queen who was king of Israel? <laughs> she wasn't really a king. She's not listed in the kings, but she put herself in that position for a period of time. So there's a lot of false stuff that happened. That's why we need to know the Old Testament. They made a lot of mistakes. And the New Testament, we're told in Romans 12, that, or actually in 1 Corinthians also, that we, the Old Testament is an example for us to follow. So we learn from their mistakes. Looking at our culture today, have we? No, we're, not, we're a Bible church. We're not a New Testament church. We're a follower of Jesus, but Jesus was predicted way back in Genesis chapter 3 to be the Savior of the world. And so we are a full Bible-believing church. And you, quite frankly, you can't understand or believe that Jesus is the Messiah unless you know the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament talks about and promises the Messiah in the New Testament. And the New Testament confirms as we go back and look in the Old Testament. So I, I, that's why I like teaching the Old Testament. First of all, it's great as I learned it because I never knew it as a kid. But secondly, it's so important to the foundation of what we believe. We are grafted into the promises of Isaac, um, Abraham according to the Messiah. And that means we need to know what those covenants are and those promises are from the Old Testament. All right, any, oh, let me, one, let me, one other thing on the sheet, the post-exilic timeline. It may be a little bit confusing to you, but you will see that below the numbers are the dates in B.C. And then as we go along, you can follow what's happening in those dates, who the kings are, when the books were written, or when the books were um, not necessarily written, but when they were, uh, it was about those time frames as to what they are. And so, um, so you've got all that with you as, you, just keep it with you as you go along, okay? It'll be helpful. You don't necessarily need it today, but you will need it. All right, by the way, I didn't tell you, uh, if you want to go back and do some research on the destruction of the northern kingdom in 722, you can find that in 2 Kings chapter 17. If you want to find out about the destruction of the northern kingdom, at least in 586, you can go to 2 Kings 25. And if you want to find out about all the conquests in, of Jerusalem, those other ones I mentioned in 605 and 597, just read the book of 2 Kings. It's all in there as to what they were doing, what the kings were like, and why they went into captivity. All right, we have 20 minutes. Are you ready to get into Ezra? <laughs> we are finally now getting directly into the word of God in this book of Ezra. So let's begin with Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, which says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyprus, of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. A lot, there's a lot there. So who is Cyrus? Persia. King of Persia. Now, I didn't go through the listing of the, the kingdom here, but when the kingdom was divided, uh, after, after the kingdom was divided, they were conquered by not only Assyria and Babylon, but then Greece, according to the statue of J Daniel chapter 2 and according to history, Greece then became the world dominant country. Um, oh, I'm sorry, before Greece, it was the Medio Medes and the Persians. And it's the Medes who conquered Babylon, and it's the Medes and Persians who worked together as kings to control that land before Greece took over in 335 B.C., and eventually Rome took over after that. So what you're seeing now are the Medes and the Persians who have conquered the Babylonians and have taken over control of the world, or at least the world at that part of the, uh, that time. So Cyrus is a Persian king. 
We're going to see a lot of interesting things about the Persian kings as we go through these books. Yeah. What's interesting about Cyrus? Now, understand, Cyrus reigned from 538 to 530 BC. So you know the time period here. But it was way back around 750 BC with Isaiah. When Isaiah said two things about Cyrus, he says in Isaiah 45, 1, Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, he is his anointed. So God is calling Cyrus his anointed. He has a purpose and a plan for him. He says, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so the gates will not be shut. So 150 years before Cyrus ever came on the scene as a king, God planned that he would be that king. Hmm. Who's the only one who knows the future? God. No other God, no other religion. They may give you their prophecies, but they're not from God. That is so important. God's in charge of it all. I got, I got to stop and, and keep that in mind because I got to go back. God's the one who removes kings and establishes kings. But vote because God has given us a privilege in this country to choose our elected officials. So yes, God does it, but God wants us to vote. Yes, God does everything, but he doesn't want us to sit home and eat bonbons all day. He wants us to serve him. So we need to vote. So I wanted to get that in before we move on. Yeah, she said somehow Cyrus got the information that the God of heaven and earth was in charge of this. Now let's think about this. This is 538 B.C. Uh, Daniel was taken captive. It's believed in, um, I think that's the second captivity. Oh, wait a minute, 605. Six, uh, in the second captivity of 597 B.C., he was taken into Babylon. He had a great influence in Babylon, if you read the book of Daniel, both as a spiritual leader, but also a political leader. And it's believed historically that they started the school of Daniel. And so there was a lot of people learning a lot about the God of Daniel. First of all, Nebuchadnezzar, if you recall, uh, who ended up eating grass because God kind of took his mind away until he recognized that God was the most high God. So even though his sons didn't really follow him, there's history there in Babylon and Assyria. Great history about knowing God. So I, te I tend to think, I don't know this, but I tend to think between God speaking to his heart and the influence of people around him, he may have come to know God. Now understand, did you know that even, uh, Dave, even Daniel was a minister to Cyrus? So Daniel directly, uh, with his personality and with uh, who he is and everything he said, he was able to talk to Cyrus. Um, let me find it. Daniel 6.28. It says, Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So Daniel had influence directly on Cyrus. That's right. You hear seeds. You, seeds are planted, and you don't know how they're going to germinate. Uh, Paul says, uh, I planted and Apollos watered, and it's God who causes the growth. I may have those two mixed up, but the point is it's God who causes the growth, but we need to plant the seeds. As I think about my salvation, 50 years ago, as Sandy was saying earlier, um, a gal told me about Jesus. Well, I knew about Jesus. I grew up Catholic. I knew all about who he was. So that, but that was a seed. And then she gave me a book, The Late Great Planet Earth, and at the end of that book was a prayer. And I said, okay, I know that, but that was a seed because I didn't know that. I mean, I, I did know Jesus, and I did think I knew, knew and had done the prayer, but it, it was those seeds that God used and implanted in me so that one night alone in, in a bed, it wasn't even my bed, I was saying to my in-laws, uh, one night alone, the spirit of the living God stirred my heart and drew me to him to a, sa a saving grace. It was the seeds that were planted, but it was God who did the work. And it's the same thing here. Going back to this, oh, I'm, I'm so many things we've got going on. So let me d give you one other thought before I go back to verse 1. Uh, I read to you Isaiah 41.1. In Isaiah 44.28, it says, It is I who says of Cyrus, this is God speaking, He is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built. And of the temple, your foundation will be led. 
So God promised in Isaiah 44, 28, that Ezra, I'm sorry, that um, Cyrus would be the one that would not just be the one, he'd be God's shepherd. God was going to use him to bring the people back to Jerusalem and to build the temple. That was 150 years before Cyrus ever came on the scene. Our God knows. Our God has a purpose. And it's our God who leads and directs. We have a responsibility. I mean, God spoke to me that night in the bedroom, but I needed to say, yes, I accept you, or no, I don't. And because of the faith that he gave me, I believed in him that night. Cyrus needed to listen. He listened. He had lots of seeds planted, but he needed to hear directly from God. And when he did, he chose to obey. Yeah, yeah, there is a cost for us not planting seeds. And you don't know how little those seeds are. But lots of seeds together can build a big plant. So you, we've got to do what God calls us to do. So let's go back. Now I want to read to you also from Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11, and then 29, verse 10. This Jeremiah, he's writing at the time of the Babylonian conquest, give or take 586 BC, all right? He says, this whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And he says the same thing in Jeremiah 29, 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. So they knew. I mean, the people who knew, knew. Uh, people who paid attention knew that in 70 years, they were going to be going back to the Holy Land. Now, it makes me wonder when Daniel's praying in Daniel chapter 9, He's talking to God about 70 years. And God uses the 70 years also for prophetic purposes throughout Israel's existence and still yet in our future. So they knew they were going back in 70 years. Since um, Cyrus is the king in 538, you go back 70 years and that would be 608. Uh, but it's not, the Jews don't go back into their promised land until 536. So that would be 606. And technically, you know, you have springs and you have falls and you have different ways to do that. But 70 years from the very first siege, which took place in 605 BC, until the people came back into their land, exactly as God had promised through Jeremiah. What hope that was. For those people who knew that, and my guess is a lot of people knew that. The, uh, if you've seen the, play of Daniel from at the Sight and Sounds, which was just played in the movies theaters recently, which is so good. Uh, Jeremiah and Daniel, Jeremiah kept talking from uh, Jerusalem, Daniel kept talking from Babylon. They were contemporaries of each other. And it, it's understood that the, whatever Jeremiah wrote got to Daniel in Babylon. So these people knew they had 70 years and then they were going back. That's a great hope. But Will God really do it? Do you ever wonder if God's really going to do what he says he's going to do? Oh, I'm proud of you who are shaking your head. I doubted that God said he was going to do what he said he was going to do. I'm not, I'm not doubted God. I've just doubted that he would actually do it the way he said he would do it or that I heard him right in what he said. But these people knew. So what? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. If he's written in his word, I believe it. A lot of times I'm not sure if I'm hearing him in my heart right, but, you know. So going back, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that's 538 B.C., that was his first year. And then it says, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, and I've just read to you what that word was that God had given to Jeremiah, it says, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. What does it mean to have your spirit stirred up by God? Now, the Hebrew word for stirred up is ur, you are. Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham came from, that's not this word, but it's the same you are word, and it means motivated or raised to action. When God stirs your heart, do you know it? You do if you're listening to him. You do if you're a disciple of his. You do if you're walking with him. 
Can you ta- can anyone share a time when God stirred your heart? That's exactly right. Every one of us in this room, if we know Jesus is our Lord and Savior, has a time when God stirred our heart. Because when it comes to salvation, you and I do nothing except believe in the faith that God gives us to believe in him. He stirs our heart. It's like those seeds that were planted for me. And that one night in the bedroom, he stirred my heart to believe. So God stirs all of our hearts, or has. But does he stir it besides salvation? Yes, he does. Ezra 7.10, I'll share with you when we get there. He stirred my heart there. Yes, you know it's from him when it becomes very clear. And we have to be careful. What happens if we ignore God's stirring of our heart? Oh, you don't want to do that. I mean, you don't want to do that because, first of all, you won't get the blessing from whatever God's doing in your life or in other people's lives. And secondly, if he's stirring you to do something and you don't do it, he will find somebody else who will do it. But you will lose the blessing. God wants to use you for whatever it is. It might be simple. Just talk to a neighbor. It might be invite somebody to Bible study. You know, it might be just something really simple. Or it might be profound. The key is just listen to God. She said, and this is very true, if we don't listen to the stirring of the Lord and we don't obey it, not just listening, it's obeying, then we will become desensitized. We'll become numb to what God is saying to us or we'll justify it. Got to be careful. We've got to do, well, we don't have to do anything. You guys can do whatever you want to do. But if you want to be a disciple of God, if you want to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, you want to do what he wants you to do. And if you haven't heard, if he hasn't stirred your heart, ask him why. God, am I doing something wrong? Am I, or am I just in a place in life where you, you just have me going, following you in everyday life? What's going on? Stir my heart to action, God. Stir my heart for you so I can serve you with all my heart in any way. It doesn't have to be big. might be something nobody ever sees. But if God's stirring you, it's important to do it. We don't let ourselves be quiet. So stirred up. That's my prayer for you this year, that you're going to be stirred up. And then it says, so then, uh, verse 1, so then he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Now, if you know the rules of the Medes and the Persians, when they wrote something down, what did that mean? It was law. It could not be repealed. Now, you could make a different law, but the law couldn't be repealed. So he made a proclamation, and he put it in writing. The proclamation was, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. He understood that everything he had was from God. Do you know that everything you have or don't have, is from God. Everything, your health, your family, your house, your kids, your grandkids, your friends, even this Bible study, everything is from God. He recognized that. He's the king. There's nobody higher than him. He didn't need anybody or anything. But he needed God, and he recognized it. And he recognized when God stirred his heart that he'd appointed him Perhaps he means by that that he had appointed him king just so he could do this very thing. And that is to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now, why did God need a house built for him in Judah, in Jerusalem? Because that's where his temple is, but his temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. We are now 538 when he has this epiphany from the Lord. The temple has been destroyed. It needs to be rebuilt. Temple was built by Solomon in 931 BC. Eh, Somewhere around 936 maybe. Built by Solomon, destroyed in 586 BC. It's going to be rebuilt. Needs to be rebuilt because until Jesus comes, that's where God met with his people. Verse 3, whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Wow! After 70 years, 
not only is the king making this proclamation that they can go back and rebuild the temple, but God's promise is coming true. It's faithful. Every time God makes a promise in scripture or prophesying, it always has come true 100% as he said it would. That means that all of the uh, 380 prophecies that are in the Bible about the second coming of Jesus Christ will come true, exactly as he said they would. And boy, are we living in those times. But that's a subject for another time. So God, he has made this proclamation. Verse 4 says, he goes on to say, Every survivor, at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with the free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So not only do they get to go out, but they get to go out with spoil. All kinds of things that they need to go up to make the journey and then to begin a new life in Jerusalem. Has there ever been a time in the Bible when God made that provision for his people when they were going into the land? When was that, Bonnie? The Exodus. Before they left Egypt, they went and asked their neighbors for goods, and their neighbors gave them to them. And now he is telling the people, telling the people to support the Jews who are going back. Verse 5. Then the heads of fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, and everyone whose spirit of God stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Now, based on that verse, did everyone go back to Jerusalem? Who went? Right. Specifically, it mentions households of Judah and Benjamin and Levites and priests. But everyone who was stirred in their heart by the Lord went up. Now, we sent our kids to Christian schools. I uh, felt that's exactly what God wanted us to do, and I'm so grateful that we had the school and did do that. But I, most of my friends didn't. They sent the kids to public schools. And I, I couldn't tell them, you know, I, 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 they didn't do anything wrong. They did what they were led to do. And that's okay, but God stirred my heart to do what I was led to do. That's why we have to be careful not to judge people because God hasn't called everybody to do the same thing. Some people are homeschooling. Some people are going to public schools. They do different things. The key is for you and I to be seeking the Lord in all decisions we make in life, big and little, because the Lord will stir our hearts. And we will learn next week how many thousands of people ended up going back, which meant that many hundreds of thousands didn't. And then it goes on to say in verse 7, Also King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and put in the house of the gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and he counted them. He counted them out to Sheshbazza, the prince of Judah. Now this was their number, 30 gold dishes, 1,000 silver dishes, 29 duplicates, 30 gold plates, bowls, 410 silver bowls of a second kind, 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver numbered 5,400. Shezbazar brought them all up with the exiles who went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. Wow, God really stirred his heart, didn't he? Where does it say what? No, Daniel never returned. He stayed in, in Babylon, which is always so interesting because here's the most godly man at that time that's in exile, and he stays. He doesn't go back. I would want to go back. But God had a purpose for him. He wasn't stirred by God to go back. That's right. So Cyrus respected God enough that he not only told the people to give them the things they need, but he returned the articles that had been taken from the temple. Now, just a side note, does anybody recall how the Babylonians used any articles that were taken from the temple? Belshazzar and the party that he had in the book of Daniel, it's mentioned, and it was in that party that the handwriting came on the wall. Mine, mini, tecum, something. You've been weighed and found wanting. And at that night, this nation was destroyed. They were drinking from the vessels from the temple and mocking God by so doing. God is not mocked. 
Yeah. The Ark of the Covenant. Yes. So we have just now the beginnings. The tone has been set. Cyrus, the most powerful man in the world at that time, has had an encounter with God. God has stirred his heart to send the exiles back and to give them all the provisions they needed to go back and to build their temple. God took this pagan king that he had planned 150, well, from the beginning of time, but uh, at least said 150 years before, he took this pagan king and he used him for his glory. Is there anyone that God can't use for his glory? Can God use President Biden? Donald Trump? Kamala Harris? Yes. Can God use you and me? If God plucked us out of the depths of hell, he can do anything. Oh, oh, good. I'm glad you said that. Persia is not modern-day Turkey. Persia is modern-day Iran. Iran. So what we're going to learn about Persia is very interesting as to how, especially when we get to Esther, as to how it relates to Iran today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the beginning, the foundations that have been set, the history, the background of Ezra, the beginnings of this book. God, how you stirred a pagan king, the most powerful man in the world at that time, to follow your direction, to have a heart for you and to do what you stirred in his heart to do. Oh, Father, I hope everyone in this room is not a pagan, but instead that we are followers of Jesus Christ. God, we ask you to stir our hearts, to show us how we might serve you and walk with you and be your example and plant seeds to other people. And most importantly, obey everything. Listen to what you have to tell us and then obey what you have to share with us. Oh, Father, may this be a year like no other year, as we learn to listen to your stirring and obey it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining Living Word Ministries. Living Word Ministries is a viewer-supported program. Please visit www.livingwordministry.org for more Bible studies and information. And please join us again for Living Word Ministries.